Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should ensure that they're switched to silent. Apologies have been received from Jackson Carlaw and Stuart McMillan and I welcome Kate Forbes as Stuart substitute and Margaret Mitchell as Jackson substitute. Um, I'd like to invite uh, members uh, who are substituting to declare any relevant interests. No relevant interest, convener. Uh, same for me, no relevant interest. Okay. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item three in private. Are members content? Our second item of business today is a round table evidence session to obtain an overview of the current state of the Scottish tourism sector. Uh, I'd like to welcome the witnesses who have come along today and I'd like to invite them to introduce themselves uh, and members as well uh, as we go around the table. So I'll start and we can move to the, to the right. Uh, I'm Joan McAlpine, uh, Committee Convener and MSP for South Scotland. Lewis MacDonald, Deputy Convener of the Committee and North East Scotland MSP. I'm David Smith. I'm Chairman of the Association of Scotland Self-Caterers. Mary Evans. I'm the MSP for Angus North and Mairns. David Weston. I'm Chairman of the Scottish B&B Association. Richard Lockhead, MSP for Murray. Uh, Riddle Graham, uh, Director of Partnerships with Visit Scotland. I'm Caroline Walton from the Scottish Tourism Alliance and I'm the National Tourism Coordinator. Margaret Mitchell, MSP Central Scotland. Tom Campbell, Managing Director of North Coast 500. Kate Forbes, MSP for Sky, Loch Haber and Badenoch. Uh, Willie McLeod from British Hospitality Association. Ross Greer, MSP for the West of Scotland. And Eva McDermott from the Association of Scottish Visitor Attractions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as I said, this, is, this session is intended as an overview of the sector to inform the committee's uh, scrutiny work uh, going forward. I mean, in many ways, it would seem to be a, a good time for Scottish tourism. Uh, statistics out uh, this morning uh, show that the number of overseas visitors last year grew by 6%. But of course, there's a great deal of ambition for the sector. There's a Tourism 2020 strategy with a very ambitious aim of growing uh, revenue from the industry by a billion uh, by 2020. That's part of the Scottish Government strategy. So I suppose my opening question would be in the light of um, that continuing success, but also the ambition for further success. Where is, the, where is the industry at the moment and what do you see as the main challenges and opportunities? Uh, who would like to start? Uh, maybe I can kick off um, from Visit Scotland's perspective. We're, we're obviously delighted to hear the, the figures that were just announced this morning, particularly in terms of the overseas visitor increase uh, and the spend that goes with it, 9% increase in, in visitor spend. Um, and we've seen over the past uh, several years um, a significant increase in direct flights coming into Scotland, which has hugely improved uh, our uh, international competitiveness. Um, and I think the industry, by and large, is in really good health. Um, we've got some forward figures for the year ahead, which suggest that bookings are, are looking very strong based on a good year last year. Um, and some of the, um, the flight details coming out from FlyB last week showing um, significant increase in forward bookings with, with them as well, particularly to the Highlands and Islands airports. So in general terms, in terms of the uh, activity and, and visitor uh, uh, throughput, um, really positive. We published our um, visitor survey um, just a couple of weeks ago at our expo event. Um, and the, uh, the figures there were very encouraging indeed. These are people who had been in Scotland and had ex experienced it um, and were talking very positively about their experience right across the piece, uh, both in terms of geography and the, the experience they've had. So um, from a Visit Scotland perspective, our, our marketing is going very well. We launched Scott Spirit last year um, to uh, great acclaim and support from the industry and that has been hugely successful uh, and much more digital marketing than we ever did before, which enables us to measure uh, the um, impact we're having much more effectively than before as well. So um, in, in general terms, uh, the figures are encouraging. We're not complacent, but, uh, but we also recognise that there are significant challenges facing the industry, and I suspect my colleagues around the table will be able to articulate more clearly than I can uh, the particular challenges facing their parts of the industry. Thank you. 
Yes, Caroline. Um, if I can just respond both uh, from the Scottish Tourism Alliance perspective, but also um, in our role as coordinators of the National Tourism Strategy, which is my role specifically. So the strategy was launched in 2012 up to 2020, um, and we did a midterm review last year. Um, and um, the levels of collaboration within what is quite a broad and disparate sector um, I think are quite extraordinary um, and we've seen a massive step change over the last um, few years. In terms of the figures, um, we still have quite a long way to go if we're to get our £1 billion target um, and certainly with the successes of campaigns such as Scott Spirit and the huge number of work, amount of work that's being done by the industry in terms of aligning and collaborating, we're getting real clarity over what the priorities from a strategic level need to be. Um, and these came through very strongly in the midterm review around leadership, uh, digital influencing investment, making sure that the country is ready and fit um, to grow tourism into the future, and also around the quality of the visitor experience and the evidence that came through from the visitor survey last week, two weeks ago, really showed that the quality um, is, we are seeing that quality T rising. In terms of some of the key issues, um, Riddle is correct, there is real optimism looking forwards, and last year seems to have been a successful year. However, there is um, growing concern, I think, amongst the industry um, about the rising costs level. Um, although visitor spend may be increasing, we're in, at the STA we're hearing more and more from businesses that um, they feel that their profits or their margins are being squeezed by both rising regulation but also by rising costs. And I'm sure my colleagues around the table will, will have more um, examples on that. So it is a good news story. Tourism is in a strong and is in rude health. However, we must, we can't be complacent, as Riddle says, we need to be mindful of the challenges which may be coming around the corner. Right. Could, could you maybe just flesh out when you're talking about rising costs? There's been a number of um, added increases through uh, regulation and legislation recently. So obviously, um, uh, uh, charges or uh, increasing costs through things like uh, national living wage, auto-enrolment, um, apprenticeship levy. Uh, we ha already have a very high VAT level um, in Scotland. APD, again, makes Scotland a, um, an expensive destination. But on top of that, we are, um, with the exchange rate um, that we have at the moment, although it's become cheaper for visitors from overseas to visit Scotland, it's also meant that a number of... Um, uh, produce that the industry will be buying is also going up in costs. So there are, there's not one issue that would solve it. It's a, it's a, it's a basket um, of issues that we, we need to look at in the round. And the STA, we, we're currently undertaking a piece of work investigating that around what are these, are we seeing a rise in costs within the businesses across the sector, um, or is it just anecdotal? And I think I think we suspect that there will be significant costs, rising costs for businesses over the last five years. But we'll have more information in October. Thank you, Caroline. David? Yes, I was just going to echo what Caroline and, and Riddle said and agree with the, those and just add to the list of, of cost items, the, the business rates issue, which, of course, has been looked at um, in, in detail. But that's an, another issue that our members have, have found uh, uh, additional costs. So... Uh, and cost inflation will be rising gen in general, so we're sort of worried looking forward at the costs creeping up. Um, I'd also mention as, as a challenge, it's not a cost issue, but as a challenge issue, the um, recent very huge rise in growth of peer-to-peer um, -peer websites like Airbnb, um, which accommodation on which is, is effectively... Uh, unregulated and undercuts businesses that are paying taxes and complying with regulations and find themselves um, undercut by similar businesses that um, have been allowed to um, trade without complying with those regulations. So that, we feel, is an issue of unfairness and where a level playing field is, is uh, required for the future. So we're happy that that's being looked at by the Scottish Government and ha happy to help take, you know, to take part in, in the inquiries that are held if, if that's held to be helpful. Thank you very much. David. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Tom. No? Tom. Tom. Yes. 
I'm Tom. <laughs> Tom. Um, just perhaps back to your, your, your first question about uh, the numbers. Um, yeah, I, I think the international figures present a real opportunity you know, for, for us in North Coast 500. Uh, we carried a survey of our, uh, some consumers, the 2,000 of them, 90% um, uh, came from the UK, 50% came from Scotland. So there is a huge opportunity in that international market that I, I think is, is untapped, um, although you know, Visit Scotland is, you know, is targeting that uh, and targeting it well, but it's a huge opportunity um, for us. Um, and certainly for us, seeing uh, you know, 50% of those who have been going around the North Coast 500 and experiencing the, the North Islands, being from Scotland, for them it's been a, an awakening um, that this was on their doorstep and they didn't realise it. And I think that, that actually feeds into uh, our whole socio-economic and, and cultural confidence as well, that we have something that um, is being classed externally as being world uh, class. Um, I think in terms of the, the challenges, uh, I haven't likened it to um, you know, the golden uh, goose is laying the golden eggs, um, and we have to be careful about the sustainability. You know, and looking at uh, infrastructure and key infrastructure, not just about roads, um, but around training and for hospitality and for the tourism sector. Um, you know, infra infrastructure around you know, visitor um, places to stop, uh, places to eat, you know, viewing points, toilets, harbours, all of these things. People focus on infrastructure as just being potholes. Um, and I think we need to look at it much wider than that, and that to include training uh, and upskilling of staff. Thank you very much, Tom. Now, David. Thanks. Um, yes, just to, just to say, um, I, I represent the soft catering industry. Um, Visit Scotland figures 23% of all visitors to Scotland stay in self catering properties. So we're a good chunk of the market, traditionally doing very well. We've just done a survey, um, volume and value of our sector, and we're worth uh, well, £723 million pounds spend to the uh, Scottish economy. Um, 3.4 million visit visitor bed nights equivalent to 15,000 jobs across Scotland. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's a major sector. Um, as far as the sort of big tourism landscape goes in the Scottish Government, I think we're very grateful, for instance, that Visit Scotland's budget's been maintained. Uh, Visit Scotland do the, do the big marketing for Scotland, and um, I think it's important the budget's maintained. And also the themed years are continuing, and that's, that's good news because that kind of focuses everybody's marketing in, in the one place and points everyone in the right direction. Um, so we welcome that. Um, our member survey that we've done recently, most, most members are buoyant at the moment and, amb and ambitious for this year coming. I think its uh, figures are looking reasonably good. But we do have a few concerns. Um, we we've touched on Airbnb and the sharing economy. We're really worried about regulations coming in which will impact on people who are not in the sharing economy particularly. It's a grey area. We talked about Airbnb. We have some traditional businesses that will be using the Airbnb as one of their routes to market. So they'll, they'll be, Airbnb will be filling some of, their, some of their bed nights, but not all. There's a traditional route to market. And um, we're just worried that um, the, the inquiry that's, that's taking place from now till Christmas will um, impact heavily on our sector how do, you, how, do you, how do you rein in uh, a sector that's growing and growing, the, the sharing economy, um, whether it should be reined in? Uh, Massachusetts in America, for instance, it's in the news today, they're looking at imposing a 12% tax on Airbnb-type properties. Berlin's banned short-term letting. So there are, there are worldwide concerns about this, and we're just... Um, we're a robust sector, valuable to the Scottish economy, and we're really worried that we're going to be impacted by this legislation if it comes in. Right, okay. Thank you very much. Eve. Eva. Hi. Eva. Um, sorry, Willie. Um, just to, again, going back to the figures, um, I, mean, I presented the, um, the committee with a small um, background briefing document. Um, most of um, what I think is the most relevant stuff is in that. Um, but I would point out on growth, I wouldn't disagree. We are growing. Um, my sector... <coughs> has had nearly 16% growth over the last three years, which is pretty good, um, given that we are a mature destination and it's a mature sector as well. Um, but I would say that Edinburgh is growing exponentially, um, and I think that is worth be taking into consideration. Um, Edinburgh is probably 50% ahead of the rest of the country. Um, and if you were to ask some of the leading operators, um, they would say you almost just have to look at um, a new flight coming in from 
Berlin, let's say, and you know that they, they can start to see their numbers grow. Um, grow. Um, and whilst I would say that it's, according to our research, um, it's probably not causing any great displacement, what it is meaning is that the, the, the growth in Edinburgh, Edinburgh is becoming like London. Thank you very much. Um, Willie. I think I would echo a lot of what's been said around the table uh, by way of opening remarks that the, the tourism sector, the sector is buoyant. I think we're very fortunate that we have uh, a strategy, Tourism Scotland 2020. I think we're very fortunate that we've got uh, a national tourism organisation that is as uh, far-sighted and innovative as Visit Scotland. Uh, however, uh, I, I think there is a reality that uh, businesses are suffering. Um, turnovers are growing modestly or uh, are static and margins are certainly being eroded. Um, we are seeing, uh, as others have alluded to, we're seeing uh, very significant increased costs. The, the devaluation of sterling has brought about uh, increased costs in imported foodstuffs, for example, in our sector, equipment, spare parts for equipment. Now that may be short term uh, because uh, sterling may rise again, we, we shall wait and see. Uh, however, there are other more fundamental costs that I think um, we're, we're seeing impacting on businesses. Um, David uh, alluded to business rates. Uh, there is, uh, in our view, a fundamental flaw with the way that hospitality and licensed businesses are rated. Uh, the system is arcane, it's not transparent. Uh, and we hope that the Barclay Review will do something permanent about it. Uh, the Scottish Government has listened to us and something temporary has been done, but if we don't have a permanent solution by April next year, we will find ourselves in the same position we were in the spring of this year, where businesses, because of business rates revaluation, uh, were extremely concerned about their ability to, to stay open, their ability to meet their obligations to banks, their ability to continue employing people. Uh, we were seeing uh, in, we were seeing average increases in rateable values of around about 75%. Uh, we've seen individual uh, rateable values increasing between 10 and 259%, and increases of 3, 4, and 500% were not uncommon in individual basis. Uh, so something has to be done uh, about um, the burden of business rates. And there are other costs. Uh, I think we... We, we regard tourism as being uh, a devolved industry, and, and uh, I think tourism and hospitality are, are well recognised and supported by the Scottish Government, and there are a lot of Scottish Government policies that support our sector. But, and without making a political point, I'm making a, a statement of reality. There are factors that affect our businesses uh, that are decided in Westminster, and uh, we have to... Um, ensure, in fact, uh, our, our own organisation, the BHA, in the run-up to the general election, uh, our focus is going to be on having uh, evidence-based immigration targets. Our businesses in Scotland, we're, we're dependent to quite a significant degree on continued free access to EU labour. Um, we think that the national living wage has to be depoliticised in the same way that the national minimum wage has been, uh, in other words, giving more power to uh, the Low Pay Commission. Um, we are uh, not a competitive country, and Scotland lies within the UK. Uh, our rate of VAT on tourism is double that of our European competitors. Uh, we constantly hear local authorities and others calling for the imposition of a tourism tax on our visitors, which our businesses would have to collect, and that would simply add to uh, the price of the, the services we deliver. So I think there has to be some reality that we do not regard tourism as the, the golden goose that keeps delivering. Um, the, the, the sector is buoyant, but there are pressures on our businesses, and if our businesses don't uh, remain profitable, we will start to lose employment. In our sector, 35% of our turnover goes on payroll. So the first thing managers look at if there's pressure on turnover or profit is look at the number of people they employ. So employment is vulnerable, reinvestment is vulnerable, and businesses are vulnerable if they, if they don't uh, generate the right levels of profit. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, on, on that particular point, I note from um, some of the briefings that we've got today that um, although employment is rising in, in, in the sector, um, the sector is the low in terms of uh, accommodation and hospitality. It's the lowest paid of any major sector. I wonder if you would like to respond to that. I know that there are issues that you have raised about costs, but clearly the issue of low pay is something that um, has been highlighted as an issue in the sector? Okay, well, I'll take that one. I don't think that's altogether true. I don't think our sector is generally low paid. Um, there, undeniably, I think there are uh, entry level and elementary jobs that are at the lower level of the pay scale that are paid either the, the national minimum or the national living wage. Um, we, I was looking at um, demand for um, uh, staff uh, figures for our industry and about 15% of the demand is for entry level or elementary jobs. About 38% uh, is demand for skilled jobs in our sector that are paid at much higher uh, levels than the, the entry level would be. Uh, there's also very rapid advancement in our sector for good people who show the right uh, attitude and aptitude and most uh, responsible employers uh, invest in upskilling and training uh, their staff. Uh, I think we are often focused, uh, there, there is a focus on our entry level and elementary jobs, yet all of our businesses employ all of the normal skills and pay the market rates for the, the people who, who fill these jobs. We employ accountants, we employ HR specialists, we employ managers, supervisors and marketing specialists. Uh, so I think to, to suggest that overall we are a low paid sector is, is wrong. Thanks for that. Just for clarity, the, the, the statistics I was quoting were from the Office of National Statistics, which were re reproduced in the Spice Briefing earning in Scotland 2016, and it said that accommodation and food services had the lowest hourly rate of the six key growth sectors identified by the Scottish Government. But you've obviously I, explained there that that's... I that think that was a median figure of £7. Uh, I have to say... Uh, my sector can't recognise where that figure, a median figure of seven pounds, comes from. Yes. A point, not a statistical point, but uh, a perception one. You know, Willie has uh, very well articulated that um, this is not just a low-skilled sector, uh, and uh, there are great career opportunities within that. I think a bit like retail, it's seen as, as a bit of a Cinderella. Or it can be at times, and you know, as Willie said, you know, focusing on the entry level uh, posts. So it's something you do on your summer holidays, it's something you do before you're going to university, and there's that perception that um, you know it, this is this is not a, a sector where you have uh, career opportunities and, and potential growth. And uh, you know, speaking with uh, someone from uh, UHI uh, in the last month, um, adventure tourism jam packed the course. You know, put golf before the word tourism and it'll be jam-packed. Put anything before the word tourism and it'll be jam-packed. Tourism, low uptake. And I think that's a perception um, that uh, the industry, you know, and the government need, really needs to tackle. Um, you know, in the same way that retail is often seen as that low entry and you're just doing it before you go into your real job. Thanks very much. Um, Caroline? Uh, just to... This is, a, well, this is an issue which uh, many of us have discussed for, for many, many years. Um, we have a skills investment plan for tourism. We have a tourism skills group, which is led by um, uh, Robert Allen, who is the HR director of Apex Hotels and has a number or many industry and agency partners around the table. And certainly the attractiveness of tourism as a career um, is one of the four priorities which are identified along with the importance of management and leadership skills and enterprise skills, so enabling many of these um, businesses which may initially start off as lifestyle businesses to really flourish and to grow into something which is really um, a significant employer in the regions, and there are many examples of that. I think also the, the, the difference between, um, or the importance of tourism jobs in the rural economy is particularly um, important uh, and is often overlooked. Um, tourism is probably, well, is, is the only, um, together with food and drink, is the only of the key growth sectors that is found in every local authority area. Um, therefore, its reach and its um, ability to be able to provide employment in areas which are often 
witnessing depopulation, for example, is, uh, should not be understated. Um, so I think it's really around talking up tourism. The range of jobs, you're correct, is, is considerable. Um, I came through the adventure tourism side of things. Um, we have skills gaps. There are people that we're looking for. We're looking for chefs. We're looking for people with languages. We're looking for people with digital marketing skills. So it may be that people don't come traditionally through a tourism course, um, but they come through a different course and end up in tourism. Um, and as a slightly... Um, uh, sort of flippant comment, um, we are helping people enjoy their holidays. Um, it's a great sector to work in. So um, I think it's about everybody talking up tourism rather than talking it down. I think there's a, a collective responsibility on all of us involved in tourism to, to talk up the industry and the opportunities it provides. Um, if uh, we find that we come up against a cliff edge in the availability of EU labour on which our industry is dependent uh, throughout the UK. Um, in, in Scotland, uh, the hospitality industry has 18% uh, non-UK employees. That's much higher in some of the city businesses. And uh, if we find that we, we encounter a cliff edge where freedom of movement of people uh, for, for work reasons is in any way hindered, uh, I think we all have a responsibility to, to make our collective industries more attractive to uh, the indigenous labour market. And indeed, uh, we've submitted to the UK government uh, um, uh, analysis done for us by KPMG looking at uh, how we address that. And we think it needs uh, a 10-year strategy to make our industry more attractive to the local labour market to people not currently uh, economically uh, active to, to people, uh, to the new generation of workers. And um, th that would have to be accompanied by some sort of transition period if uh, tourism generally in the UK and in Scotland is not going to suffer and growth isn't going to be hampered by a lack of employees. Thank you very much, and we're very um, uh, grateful to the submissions that, that yourself and others around the table made to our ongoing inquiry into the implications of the EU referendum for Scotland. That was very useful evidence. I'd like to bring in Lewis MacDonald now. Thank you very much, and uh, an interesting set of issues have come up in the opening comments. I guess I go back to the visitor service uh, that Riddle Graham mentioned in relation to the visitor experience, and of course. We all want to and, and should celebrate the positive uh, aspects of that, but it's, it's part of our job as a committee to scrutinise the less uh, encouraging aspects. And, and two things stood out for me in, in uh, looking at the, 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 the findings. One was the phrase that a gap exists between expectation and experience of the quality of food in Scotland, particularly for international visitors. And the other was that satisfaction with digital connectivity is lower than all other aspects of the trip. So I'd be interested on both these difficult areas in relative terms uh, to hear views about where we are, what needs to be done to meet those challenges and how we're getting on with doing that. Um, if, I, if I can uh, respond on, on, on both um, and then I suspect others will, will follow suit. Um, we obviously work very closely with Scotland Food and Drink in terms of the whole provenance piece and in terms of the way that we want to promote the very best of, of Scottish produce. We have um, a Taste Our Best scheme which uh, has been uh, adopted by over 1,200 businesses throughout uh, the country um, and so we have strong links with other parts of Scottish Government in terms of that whole agenda. I've got to say that um, although there is a, a, is a gap, uh, it's quite interesting that if you look at the um, the data, um, the expectation before people came and their actual um, expectation after they'd been is it, quite interesting. And I think a lot of people came with a perception that the food wasn't going to be so good um, and it's been much better. And, and there's been significant improvement uh, over the past three or four years in terms of that. The really interesting one, I think, and you've picked up on it, is that whole digital connectivity piece. When we did visitor surveys, um, even four or five years ago, it was never on the agenda, it was never mentioned. But now it is the single most significant factor that uh, visitors mention. Uh, either mobile signal or not being able to get access to Wi-Fi um, or, or uh, being able to use 
uh, their piece of plastic that they hold in their hand. Um, and I think that is very important indeed. Now, there's a huge number of initiatives going on to try and improve the situation throughout, throughout government and throughout the whole of the country. Uh, but I think um, it would be folly for us to ignore that because our information strategy is based almost entirely on that, people being able to access information when they want it, where they want it, and how they want it. And if people are struggling to get uh, a signal in some way, then, then that curtails that significantly. So um, I think you're right in highlighting it, and, and you know we're working with, with a, a number of bodies to, to improve that. The, the other side of that, of course, is getting the industry uh, to be smarter in terms of using digital connectivity in their in their day to day work in, in terms of their business operations. So being online bookable, uh, encouraging user generated content, um, and and also uh, in improving the whole their presence on the internet and um, working through Digital Tourism Scotland and our partners in, in the public and private sector, um, we see that as a huge uh, a huge opportunity as well. Eva. Um, yeah, on the um, digital connectivity, um, we did our um, membership survey satisfaction with our members last year, we do it every two years. Um, what were the big issues? And the t one of the top three was the lack of digital connectivity. Um, so it's coming from the industry as well as, <coughs> excuse me, coming from industry as well as coming from visitors. Um, I heard something interesting um, on the radio last week, and it was someone in London saying that they had problems in certain areas of London getting a mobile signal. Um, it is a big problem, um, and it, it's, a, it's an issue. Um, and I, I know that government speaks to the, the, the big telecoms companies and so on, but um, it, it, it certainly is a problem, and I would just endorse what Riddle said. On food and drink, we've been trying to work, we are working, with Scotland Food and Drink, and um, I feel passionately about lo um, purchasing local food and drink. I really feel passionately about it. Um, you, we should be pushing an, an open door, and we're not. <laughs> it's, I, and I don't know why. Um, the Taste Our Best is, you know, it's kind of stuck where, where it was maybe a year ago. We're not much further forward in terms of people who are buying into or actually marketing it internally to, to industry um, and enabling them. And as I say, I speak with Fiona Richmond at Food and Drink on a very regular basis. <coughs> and um, they say that they don't have any money to help support put, put on events which would showcase. There's one happening in Edinburgh actually next month um, where they've, they've managed to get some funding from um, private sponsors. Um, and we don't, we're a membership organisation, we're, we're quite poor. Um, we certainly don't have big money to put in behind, you know, large scale events to help um, lo at a local level in Ayrshire, for example, to bring people along and, you know, find out what the local producers have. So there is an issue about matching up small people with other small people, because that's what we're talking about. Thanks very much. Um, I'll maybe take one, one more contributor, but I'm anxious to make sure that the members get to the opportunity to ask their questions. So, um, yes, Tom. Um, just in the, the gap in the expectations, uh, North Coast 500 has sort of got the reverse problem. Um, you know, we, we have, over the last 18 months, two years, you've been ranked, you know, by National Geographic Traveller, the number two reason to travel out of 101 reasons to travel. Uh, Condé Nast ranking it as the, the number one touring route in the world. So people come with expectations way, way up here for us. Um, and, um, and so the worry is, that is, does it live up to the hype? And, and it does, because people are then still saying this is the number one in the world. So, um, but we can't be complacent about that either. And looking you know, at the food and drink is a key component of, of visitors' experiences. And my own anecdotal evidence is bringing four American friends last year to do the North Coast 500, which was a bit of a busman's holiday for me. But we went round, and at the end of the, the eight-day trip, I said to them, so what was the standout thing for you? And unprompted by me, they were there last north of Inverness in 2000. And they said, um, the food. The food in the last 16, from 16 years ago to now, was just worlds apart. And I think sometimes we can beat ourselves up about uh, our offering and sometimes we, we, we don't actually see what's in front of us. Uh, but actually, it's a very small sample of four people. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, and unreliable people too. But, um, uh, you know, sometimes we're too close to actually see how good we are. And there are some, you know, there are exceptional um, uh, producers uh, and suppliers uh, in Scotland. 
and digital connectivity. Um, you, know, you don't have to be in the North Islands for that to be uh, a challenge for you. But I think we need, what we do need to do um, is look at what are the opportunities around these challenges for us. Okay, uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to hear that sort of positivity. Um, on the back of that, I've got a question about the North Coast 500 model, because obviously there's a question about how we bring everything together, the food and drink, how we together meet some of the challenges, whether that's digital, whether it's infrastructure um, of other kinds, roads, etc., how we bring it together. I know that there are several um, sort of community organisations or, or business organisations that are, are local, so Argyles and the Isles um, a Tourism Cooperative, for example, and um, Visit Reness Loch Ness. Uh, What's the North Coast 500 model and are you aware of any other models where they've brought together locally um, solutions to meet some of the challenges? Caroline, um, well, I, do you want to answer no, first, Tom? Yeah, as yeah, the... yeah, I will. On the North Coast 500 model, um, uh, we, you know, when we established this and we're, we're, we're looking at establishing this, um, I was of, view, of a view that this had to be different. Traditionally, you know, um, you know, destination management organisations, if that's what you want to call us, are publicly funded. Um, and, you know, funding tends to be for short bursts um, and tends to then just die away. So, you, so a bit like fireworks in the sky, you get this burst of activity, everyone's hugely excited. You know, one or two, three, four, half dozen projects are created, everyone thinks it's fantastic, and then it goes because the funding has gone. So we knew the model had to be different. Um, and for us, this was about monetizing the brand. The way of making this sustainable was actually um, not having the core costs publicly funded, but actually having this as a private sector um, uh, invested model. And key for us is how we monetize the brand. Um, Professor John Lennon carried out our scoping study and proof of concept, and he said the key, the golden key you need to find is how you monetize the brand. Because in monetizing the brand, you then create an income stream, which then creates, lo creates longevity. I think Roger Lockhead wanted to come in on that issue. I'll let others answer first. I was going to come right, in okay. back for Kate's question. Yeah. Caroline. Um, so in terms of the destinations, we've done a bit of work looking at the um, destinations, are obviously a key strand of the tourism strategy. Um, we use a number of between 20 and 25 destination groups in Scotland um, and every single one of them is different. So there is no one model that we have um, successfully worked in Scotland, I think I would say. Um, now that may, people may say, oh well this means that it's, it's, it's not right and I think it's quite the opposite. I think it just shows how innovative and creative the sector is to um, capitalize on the resources and the skills that are available within their destinations and everyone is different. Um, the two examples I would pull out, one is our Girls in the Isles Tourism which you mentioned and this is really a really creative way of looking at the destinations all of which have the issue of financial sustainability. That is probably one of the key issues for these destination groups. We ask them to deliver a lot for very very little and often um, quite transitory resources. Argyle in the Isles Tourism brought together the local tourism groups, the 11 um, local tourism associations, as they call them, um, into a cooperative model. So they have 11, I think they have slightly more than that now, uh, members. Um, and as a result of that, they've um, managed to secure significant funding from the local authority, from Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And they're now doing really creative marketing with Glasgow. Um, they've just done their Wild About Argyle campaign, which is really having traction. And it's all around collaboration is really collaboration and leadership are the two words. The other one is Visit Inverness Loch Ness. And they are one of the few associations, or not associations, destination groups that have um, got a significant contribution of private sector funding. And that is on the simple reason that they went down the bid model. Um, and therefore, there is a levy which is being paid by businesses um, across the region. Now, it's a five-year business plan. They're starting to come towards the second half of that. So they will be looking for that re um, election of that of that business plan and that model and um, if businesses are being squeezed in other ways such as business rates and other costs then it may be that businesses decide not to vote for this it's a completely democratic process and there have been other destinations in Scotland that have looked at this model and have tried to adopt the similar model and the local industry has said 
it's not for us. So um, there is no single um, success or no single model that has been adopted throughout. Um, it is something which I would welcome the opportunity for us to look at in considerably more detail because, as I say, we rely on our destinations and there is millions of pounds worth of in-kind time put in from businesses, all of whom are running their own businesses, in addition to, um, to trying to lead our destinations for us. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Richard, did you want to come in? Hey, thank you. Just on the theme that uh, Kate Forbes picked up on, on. Clearly, the stats today are very positive, and to me, as I'm sure to everyone else around the table, there's massive untapped potential throughout Scotland, uh, even starting from this good point where we are at the moment. And there's clearly a national approach, and then there's the local approaches, and we've heard of some good examples of, of local approaches. Uh, so my two questions are, firstly, when you look at some of the national approaches, like attracting events to Scotland, and apparently, according to this briefing, the Scottish Government are going to devote up to £63 million uh, on the 2018 European Championships, plus there's various other examples that are going to receive substantial funding. And then locally, we have our, our local destination organisations and our constituencies that are scrambling around for £15,000, £20,000 to, to do some good work. Uh, and in my case, in my constituency, of course, we've got the Murray Speyside Tourism Initiative, which is doing some really good work, but is struggling for funds. So can the, our, our witnesses comment on how we strike that national local balance and secondly picking up on Tom's partial answer to that the private sector so if I was to use my own constituents as an example we've struggled for many many years to engage the chief executives of the whisky companies with exceptions local owned companies like Gordon McPhail are very supportive of local initiatives but the Pernod Ricards or the Agios shall we say, are much more challenging in terms of engaging their chief executives in promoting regional tourism. Uh, and what better advert can you have for Speyside than the, uh, the hundreds of millions of bottles that have that word on it that are exported every year from Scotland? So can people comment on how we get the private sector on board to promote local initiatives? Yeah, um, specifically on the, the second point, I, I can uh, advise Richard that uh, a meeting that we've been trying to get with senior officials the Azure is happening this afternoon with my chief executive, so okay, can I, yeah, re reassure you that uh, we've taken that very seriously indeed, and we'll certainly um, raise the issues that you've been uh, very vocal on in terms of that opportunity. Ask, is it chief executive? Uh, no, it's not. No, there you go. Uh, but it will be a senior official that we will yeah. uh, try and make sure that we engage. And uh, anyway, we're, we're very aware that, um, particularly with the whisky industry, I was in Isla um, a couple of weeks ago and uh, working there with the distilleries to enhance that whole uh, collaborative approach through uh, the distilleries working together uh, is something that we want to uh, encourage because they have a, a huge uh, international visitation as, as uh, you've already highlighted. I think you make a, a really good point about the, the national local piece. We uh, within Visit Scotland have been looking at our whole approach to engaging with uh, local organisations, uh, destination groups, whatever they may be called. Um, and, and Caroline, I think, has, has covered that point really well. I think sometimes it's not always about money. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes it's about um, identifying where they can make the biggest difference. We engage on a collaborative basis through our growth fund, uh, and a number of destinations throughout Scotland have, have tapped into that and have been hugely successful in terms of the marketing. I think uh, their role is, is absolutely about bringing people together, uh, bringing businesses together, and they do that really well on a collaborative basis. It's also about identifying um, where we can add value, and sometimes it's about the data and the, uh, and the, uh, the information and the insights that we can bring to enhance their marketing. <clears throat> Give you a good example. We've been working over the past year with uh, Fort William and Loch Haber, uh, and the, the local tourism uh, group there uh, uh, to the extent that now um, all, all the data on our website is drawn through to theirs and so that they have saved a lot of money in having to duplicate services um, and we're looking to enhance that, that, that uh, project throughout the whole of the country um, where we provide a lot of the central uh, uh, marketing on behalf of local destinations uh, and we're encouraging 
um, each destination, rather than spend a lot of money on, on duplicating, but, all, but rather uh, identifying uh, the content that they can provide us with, the rich content. And a great example of that is NC500, where they've worked with us really closely in terms of the marketing to enhance that. But I think you're right, there's, there's more that can be done. And when we speak to destination organisations, that sustainable funding model is one that, that, uh, that really does challenge. One of the challenges is, of course, the lack of large players in the tourism industry that are able um, to contribute financially um, throughout the country. Um, uh, and I think that's something that Tom's managed to uh, work really well in, in NC500 and we can learn from. I actually think we need to turn this completely on its head um, and stop thinking about giving out 15,000 here and 20,000 there and asking uh, corporates for uh, effectively CSR donations and doing good. Um, you know, business, we're not talking a business language to corporates. And we should act, they would much, much easier, we find it much easier to listen to a language that says, you know, this is going to have a financial impact and longevity. You know, so your, your contribution um, and, and your involvement means that in five years' time we will still have an impact and in ten years' time we will continue to have an impact because uh, we've created a model that, that will create financial sustainability. And I think we absolutely need to put this on its head and stop thinking about throwing 15,000 here and 15,000 there. It is not, in my opinion, creating sustainability in, in so many. And actually what we're doing is we're raising expectations and then we're just dropping folk off the cliff again. Um, and in terms of our, our business uh, model, um, uh, we have to be sustainable. You know, we, we have to um, break even and make a profit. And if we don't, we're out of a job. And, and it's as hard and as brutal as that. And that's how it has to be. If North Coast 500 is going to be here in 10 years' time, you know, that's the business model that, that we have put together. OK. Willie McLeod. I think there's uh, an invisible contribution from the private sector that is often unrecognised. I think every, every single business involved in tourism in Scotland is investing in marketing its own business. Uh, it's investing in traditional marketing, it's investing in websites, it's investing in reservation systems. And all of that activity is directly promoting Scotland and, uh, and the destinations in which the businesses are located. And I think it's very difficult to actually quantify that and put a, put a figure on it. But uh, every business that has a website that is marketing, promoting the business, is also promoting the area and what the area has to offer. And I don't think we recognise that enough as, as a contribution that businesses are making. OK, thank you. Um, Mary Evans. Yeah, sorry, I've been taking loads of notes throughout and I think I've got quite a few questions. I might just fire them all out and see uh, what, what everyone uh, comes back with. Um, touching on Richard's point as well, I think that was vitally important because I, in my constituency, I mean, we have a lot of big events. We have MoFest, which, uh, 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 which is happening next weekend, actually, just a little advert in case anybody wants to make it along. We have international acts attending. I think it's the Beach Boys this time round. They had Brian Adams last, last year. Um, Harley Davidson in the city. There's some big connections there in Brechin, where I live and the Fireballs event in Stonehaven at New Year. You know, there's massive things uh, going on that when you see, like Richard pointed out, the, some of the, the sums of money that are being invested in some of those events, it is in terms of what kind of support can be given to these, if that's in terms of marketing. Um, and I'd be interested to hear I, I, from Visit Scotland about if, do you wait on the, those events and the people that organise them coming to you? Is that done uh, through local authorities as well? Um, but in terms of some of those events as well, I mean, particularly in Angus, that's something we've struggled with is actually accommodation and having accommodation to put people up when they come and visit. And um, following on from that too, we have the V&A, which is uh, the buildings coming on uh, in, in Dundee. And it's how we are able to I think that will be a massive visited attraction for the northeast of Scotland, but it's then how we draw people out of that into the likes of Angus for, um, and other local authority areas around there too, and how they're able to reap the benefits uh, from that. In terms of agri-tourism as well, there's an organisation, Go Rural, um, which has been uh, working with lots of rural businesses. It ties into the whole food and drink thing too, because it's about people coming visiting farm learning about the food uh, and getting that the most local of experiences there is that something that's on the agenda and something that you're looking to develop 
as well. And one last point, um, I think it was Caroline that said earlier that you know, tourism is significantly, of significantly higher importance to the economy of many rural and coastal communities uh, 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 disproportionately. Um, and for example, in Aberdeenshire and the northeast, one of the key European markets is Germany, and there's the increased connectivity that they've had to Frankfurt to try and uh, develop those connections too. And it would just be the impact of Brexit on that element. We've already covered uh, Brexit in terms of what that means for uh, migrant labour and how important that is, but also in terms of those connections which we've been, which we've been trying to build up and how we keep those going. Okay, thank you, Mary. Quite a lot in there. Um, David Weston, did you want to come back in? There are, I'm aware that there are issues around infrastructure that a number of people have, have raised as a challenge. So, well, I was, Yes, thank you. I was going to echo the points that were made a couple of times about the importance of rural and coastal tourism. And B&Bs and guest houses can obviously help um, capture that tourist pound and make it f uh, filter into those economies, which are often fragile economies. And uh, so B&Bs and guest houses are often the only accommodation in uh, rural areas, small villages. Uh, and perhaps when, if there's a problem with specific large events in, in areas, um, B&Bs and guest houses can help disperse some of the visitors to uh, and accommodate some of those visitors. And I know we're a fragmented sector, but we as an association may be able to help sometimes with that, with uh, liaising with the, with the um, planners of events and festivals and uh, on, on that kind of accommodation. And I'm sure the self-catering people would say the same. We're all, all happy to, to, to sit down when these things are being planned ahead, ahead to see how our members can sort of help um, with the accommodation of, of, uh, of um, festivals and events. Riddle. Uh, yeah, um, try and answer some of your, your questions, Mary. Um, it's a combination of both. Um, event organisers come to us for advice. We have a separate events directorate, um, and we provide advice on, on best practice, how to run an event more successfully, more sustainably, um, and how to market. We often find that with small events, the event organisers are hugely passionate about the subject, but maybe not so good about the marketing and the promotion. So we have a role there in, in helping. Um, we have um, an events fund, um, often linked to um, our themed years, uh, where we provide funding to help promote. Um, uh, on our uh, main consumer-facing website, visitscotland.com, we have a big section on events, um, and we, we rely on, on local event organisers to provide uh, content for that. I think you make a good point about uh, accommodation. Some of the... Now, the big events um, do come under a lot of pressure. I'm thinking about the Open Golf Championship as an example. Uh, dare I mention it in the presence of David, but Airbnb um, provide a particularly uh, significant uh, facility there at a local level. And, you know, I hear Airbnb being maligned in, in many cases, but actually we need to learn from them. Um, they do an awful lot of good. Um, they've got 16,000 hosts in Scotland. Um, uh, and they have a, a, a marketing model that uh, is the envy of a lot of others. So whilst I recognise there's a, an issue around regulation, they're also very keen to work with um, event organisers. And I know they sponsored the, um, the Edinburgh Fringe a couple of years ago. So there's, a, there's a, an opportunity there. Good point about the v and um, We're looking at a, a, a different approach to um, how we measure quality. Uh, and we recognise and we've identified Dundee as an example where we can look at quality in the round and look at the whole visitor experience. So when people arrive, how do they get there and what's that experience like? What's the accommodation like? In addition to the attraction, what other things can, can be done in the area, not just in the city? Um, and what's the eating and drinking facilities like and what's the retail? So looking at that in the round rather than just in, in separate sections and trying to identify areas where we can do better because we firmly believe that the v &A will bring additional and new visitors that would never have come to Scotland before and so how do we enhance that experience and it's spread it absolutely beyond the city. So that's part of the overall strategy, working with the local authorities in that area uh, and linked to the city deal. Um, I know Caroline Miller very well, so I'm very aware of Go Rural, and, and David uh, does as well. She's constantly bending her ear, and I think Richard will uh, uh, note that as well uh, in his 
previous role as, uh, as minister. Um, she's hugely passionate, and quite rightly, because agritourism is hugely important to the economy of Scotland, the rural parts in particular. Uh, and she's argued the case really well, and we've recognised that, and, and we've been working with her particularly on the marketing side. Um, and yeah, you, you point to um, the Brexit issue, and I suspect others will have a, a view on that, but we recognise that Europe, uh, Germany is our second most important international market, and we want to, uh, to grow that even further. And we are obviously concerned about the potential negative impacts that Brexit may have. Caroline, if you could, um, I'll be, be as very brief. brief as possible. I was just going to pick up on two, two quick points. The first one um, around the agritourism and go rural, and we all know Caroline Miller very well. Um, but the good news is that Scotland Food and Drink are actually um, at the early stages of developing a food tourism program um, as a result as a result of the launch of their new strategy, which I think is going to be significant. Um, and ourselves, Visit Scotland, and many of the other partners will be involved. So I think food tourism, both in terms of its quality, but the links to agriculture um, and to the, the sort of the the expectation. Um, issue that you raised, um, I think we will, be, we will see that starting to come together a bit more coherently over the next year. So I think there's a watch this space for that. So that's really good news. Um, with respect to the events, um, I've been to MoFest for the last three years. It's excellent. Thoroughly recommend it. Um, in terms of the accommodation challenge, um, it's really about using the local businesses. And I suppose my knowledge of Angus is that I don't think that there is a destination group an industry destination group for Angus. Um, and what has been very effective in other areas is using that network as a destination to actually move people away from Montrose or wherever the um, event is if the accommodation is, fill, is full. So I suppose I would encourage um, the local council and the industry to come together to see whether there is some structure or network that would help to mitigate some of these um, bottlenecks, which will only occur probably at certain times of the year. Right. Did you want to come in, David? Just with a quick Issue. point on, on Brexit, if that's all yes, right, and course. it's to do with yes. rural funding. And um, at the moment, you guys deal with Europe in this committee. There is the Rural Leader um, programme that goes ahead. Lots of many projects right across Scotland in, in rural areas, a good proportion of which are tourism. The new boats on Loch Tay, for instance, are, are leader funded. And we're very worried that this section of funding will just disappear when we leave Europe and it won't be replaced. And it's, I think it's something that needs to be kept an eye on, needs yes. to be watched. And it's certainly something that came up a lot in the evidence that we gathered in our inquiry and um, uh, the parliamentary committees will be taking it forward. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I was interested in some of the, the contributions, the sustainability aspect, not relying on perhaps just a themed um, initiative to give a spin-off or, or even uh, some of the Brexit funding, also the local uh, national balance and um, also the challenges that were mentioned which bring us, I think, full circle where business rates were mentioned as a key challenge. Now, Willie gave, um, I think, some examples of just um, how, how they're impinging on businesses' ability to be sustainable. And I wondered if we could go around the table and see, given that the Barclay Review Group is due to report in July, just what in the sector you think could be done to improve the business rate system. And just on a national local thing, I'll, I'll put a suggestion in, would it be welcomed, for example, for local authorities to have control of business rates and to be able to retain the money from business rates? And then if you have tourism as um, a very big part of your local authority, a very big um, industry there, employer there, then the business rate system could, could reflect that. Just one idea, I hope people around the, the panel would have others. Really? I mean, we, we have uh, made several suggestions to Barclay, uh, both in writing and orally. Um, I think one main suggestion would be that, uh, regardless of what else Barclay may say, I think the assessor uh, needs to get round the table with the industry mm -hmm. and with uh, the industry's professional advisors and really look at the way they approach our sector. Yep. And yep. there are some lessons to be had from the way the Valuation Office Agency uh, deals with things in England and Wales. On the second point, really, of uh, local authorities um, being responsible for or retaining uh, business rates, I think we 
probably would have to see a much better worked up proposition before we responded to that. I think the, the principal concern would be one of uh, inconsistency in uh, rates and uh, creation of uh, a less than competitive playing field across uh, the country of different uh, businesses, uh, different local authority areas were, were applying different rates. You could turn that on its head and say it could make one area more competitive against another. Uh, and that's why I say I think we, we need to look at that a lot more carefully. Um, I think our principal concern, we, in fact we had a press inquiry about that just the other day, I think our principal concern would be uh, the, the setting of poundages based on uh, local political preferences as distinct from a national business or economic overview based on uh, looking at poundages that way. Sorry, Tom. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, inevitably, any increase in, in, in anything really round about rates is just seen as a tax, and no one, the businesses perhaps don't see any benefit from that. Perhaps don't see a benefit from the tax, certainly don't see any, a benefit from the increase. Um, I think one of the challenges um, that we have is the bid model. The bid model for the tourism bid uh, was mentioned at Loch Ness. Um, I think there's a real challenge to the bid model now as we see um, you know, business rates um, increasing. Um, and perhaps of combining those two together, a fanciful idea might be uh, making the benefits of that increased uh, uh, visible to those who have to pay them by taking a percentage of that increase and effectively putting it into a bid type of model. And so that there is real visibility about what they'll be getting, they're actually getting a, a real benefit out of this for the okay. tourism sector. So hypothecated, really. Uh, Eva? Um, yeah. uh, just to, to agree with Willie, I think um, it probably does need to be brought up to date now in terms of a meeting with um, the assessors, Scottish assessors, um, because they... Um, their complete. I mean, their methodology is completely robust. It's probably just a bit out of date, um, and they, they do set themselves up as you know as being independent, and that, that their their thing is transparent. But it's so transparent, the spaghetti is like that underneath it. You know, you look at the practice notes about how they come to 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 get a, a rate, um, um, a rateable value, and it's just. It's mind blowing, you know. In my sector, um, where you've got historic buildings, you've got different kinds of buildings. It, it's so difficult; they really can't get their head around it. And maybe we are um, an example of what tourism is like generally. This is not um, this is not a big high-rise um, office block that's owned by a multinational, and um, where it's easy to take the measurements and, and apply, um, a, you know, the, the maths uh, to it. Um, and so I do think that it probably is overdue that we need this, uh, we need a meeting, um, a proper high level meeting with the Scottish assessors to see if there's not another way that we could, you know, look at um, re-rating. The other thing is, my sector is different from most other sectors, but we're a mix of private sector, public sector, charities, trusts, and as we know, charities and trusts don't pay any commercial rates, don't, don't pay business rates at all. So effectively, um, you, the private sector is almost cross-subsidising those areas. Um, and anyone who's got any interest in education can apply for charitable trust status. They don't always get it. Um, so it's, it is a very uneven playing field. And I, I would suggest that some of the, as I say, um, some of the maths... Um, probably relates back to things that were ha practices that were happening 50 years ago and maybe not today. David, did you want to come yes, in? Yeah. It's, um, our sector had one of the highest um, increases at 68% average. You know, again, like, like Willie's members, over 200% for some, some, some businesses. Um, we, we have a good relationship with our assessors that we deal with. Um, we kind of know the spaghetti quite well. But even so, we didn't get a good result that everybody could understand. The seven-year gap that we've had between the last revaluation is just far too far apart. We think we think Barclay should consider a three-year revaluation because even five years, it starts to get very historical. I think anything shorter than three years, the assessors wouldn't wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't cope wouldn't cope with wouldn't cope with it. Um, I have to say, many of our members do benefit from the small business bonus scheme, which is um, that may you know what government can give, government can take away. So you kind of have to put that to one side. 
And well, you do. You have to look. <laughs> you have to look right. Uh, my understanding is the small business bonus scheme has been expanded. Yes, it has been yeah. expanded, and we're very grateful. Absolutely, absolutely, very grateful. But you know, Barclay might come in and change that, or he might say, right, you instead of getting 100% relief, you only get 75% relief, or whatever it is. It's a landscape that may change. It's political. We're looking at rateable valuations um, in, in the round. Um, we're grateful for the cap that the government gave us. It was at 12.5% plus inflation, which was very helpful to some of our members that have suffered big increases. The cap is only until next year, and I think there's a bit of hard talking that has to happen between now and then to see what happens you know, for 20, you know, 2018, 19 going forwards, because we're just going to be in the same black hole again. Um, it'll be compounded business costs also you know, with, 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 with Brexit and also with wages now not, not meeting inflation there's a, a, a squeeze in terms of um, people's ability, people's spending ability, which I think is going to come um, round to bite us maybe by this time next year. Okay. David Weston, did you want to come in? Just to echo what people have uh, said on this and, and just add that I th hope that Barclay Review will look, take a step back and look widely at the whole thing and particularly where uh, the definition of a business starts and how you define a business, particularly in this new world of um, sharing economy where um, a lot of our members maybe only have one or two or three letting bedrooms in their own home. Is that a business? Uh, when is that defined as a business? Why do they pay a charge, a, a tax, when a competitor the same size next door isn't paying that? You know, it's, it's level playing field, and it's, it's just looking at where that starts and how you treat very small businesses um, at, at, at the beginning of that chain, you know, how you define a, a micro business to encourage the sector and to encourage the growth in tourism uh, across the country. Okay. Thanks very much. Now, um, I'd like to get Ross Greer in next, please, if I could. Thanks, convener. Um, come in intending to ask about short-term lets, and both David's got in straight away with your first comments on it, but you said slightly different things um, around it and around how we regulate that sector, because it's growing massively. I think the estimate is there are over 6,000 in Edinburgh already, and it's essentially unregulated. What is it you would like to see come out of this move towards regulation? Thank you for the question. What we've been saying is just very simple, that we think there should be a level playing field and similar size businesses or micro-businesses should just comply with this similar regulations. It's as simple as that. We're not asking for a whole lot of new regulations to be lumped onto Airbnb, uh, that, that, you know, that wouldn't be right either. But it's not right that a business has to comply with a, a list of rules and regulations, whereas the same size business next door, because it simply has chosen a different business model, should effectively not comply with anything. Uh, so either deregulation to make micro-businesses uh, to take them out of those regulations or to apply the regulations that there are consistently to all businesses. Uh, it, it, we welcome competition. We're, our whole lives, I think everyone around this table from the industry would say the same. Uh, it's, it's a very competitive industry. We're all competitive with each other. We're all competitive. B&Bs are competitive with hotels, with self-catering. Our whole life, we, 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 we and with other B&Bs, of course. So we're used to competition. But it has to be fair by being just the same on the same basis. That's, that's all, all we've been asking for. We've, we've, issued a code of, we've issued a code of practice for city self-catering, which we've um, given to Edinburgh Council and Glasgow Council and also Airbnb, and it's been actually quite well, well received. Um, obviously, um, like like bed and breakfast, we, we would like to see a you know, level playing field, but there are existing rules that can be enforced. The fire regulations are existing rules. They can be enforced. And rather than come in with great heavy boots, I think um, there's, there's a lot to be said for seeing what we can do. At the end of the day, cities have to find a balance. You know, the, the, the concerns are between loss of residential amenity, um, you know, housing stock being taken up by, by, by holidays, party flats, concern about that. There are ways of dealing with that. There is existing legislation to deal with that. But um, at the end of the day, you have to find a balance between residents and also economic growth and tourism. And I think if the inquiry can look, look at that sensibly rather than um, uh, emotionally, thank you, then I think we'd be in a better place. 
Following on from that point about the balance between the rights of residents versus economic growth, I'd like to pick up on a point that um, Eva made at, at the start around the exponential growth in Edinburgh compared to other areas of the country. If you take the most extreme example of that, that I can think of is in Barcelona, where the agenda now is in essentially degrowth around tourism, is in reclaiming the city because the mood of the population there has shifted so much, they feel that they've lost a lot, and that's now the, the prevailing political wind. Um, that's, not that's not a desirable place for us to, to get towards. How do we ensure that, for a start, we are spreading that growth, that Edinburgh is seen as, more, Edinburgh is seen as a, a staging destination that tourists might arrive there and travel elsewhere in the country after having spent a few days, um, but also that we are getting that balance right for the rights of residents. Residents don't feel as if they're being put upon and the hostility starts to build towards the industry. I think Edinburgh is what it, what it is. Edinburgh, if you look at Scotland, Edinburgh is one of the, the, the first destinations that, that, that gets searched for. The Highlands is the second. I think if we had a magic bullet to get everybody out of Edinburgh, and the, the, Go, the Go Rural initiative was actually originally around getting people out of Scotland cities. It was on a 90 mile, 60 mile, 90 mile travel time, I think, wasn't it? And um, yeah, if, you know, if, the, if there's a magic bullet, I think we'd certainly do it. But Edinburgh is what Edinburgh is. It, yeah. it's, it's a world heritage destination. Mm -hmm. Willie, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I was going back to the regulatory point. Uh, I, I don't think any of us object to any new form of competition coming along and, and Airbnb and the like are exactly that. Uh, I think the issue has to be one of a level playing field of uh, a competitive environment, uh, certainly within the, the regulatory regime. But I, I think the, there are difficulties with the current regulations in that there are different thresholds that apply. Uh, there are different thresholds for planning, there's different thresholds for fire, there's different thresholds for uh, compliance with environmental health, there's different thresholds for um, uh, whether you, you pay, pay business rates or not. So I, I think uh, if you start looking at the regulatory regime, I, I think you have to look at harmonization of thresholds and beginning to define what is a small accommodation business and how that, how that, how that is better defined. Um, I think the other issue uh, on the small business bonus scheme, and I'm not going to be terribly popular for saying this, is that it is paid for by other businesses who pay the large business supplement. And I'd argue very strongly that a business with a rateable value of £56,000 a year is not a large business by any of the, the defined uh, uh, definitions of, of, of small business. And uh, I think we have to look uh, carefully at uh, every business that benefits from whatever benefit we get from rates, there's, there's an argument that every business should be paying something uh, into the pot and not being subsidised by larger businesses that are paying uh, additional rates um, to, to meet the cost of these bonuses. Thank you. Riddle. Yeah. Just uh, to respond to Ross's second point about Barcelona and the example, I, I think that's a point well made. Um, we led on the creation of a tourism development framework which identified uh, areas of opportunity in terms of investment. And, and one of the challenges, I think, is it's not so much about the volume of visitor, but the kind of visitor. Um, and there's a great example in Edinburgh where if you now walk along um, Princess Street from one end to the other, um, huge increase in the number of budget hotels. Now, the question is not so much about, that's great, there's, n there's new bed spaces and I have nothing against budget hotels, but if you're positioning Edinburgh for the future, um, should the planners, when making decisions, uh, identify opportunities to upscale uh, the accommodation? And we've got a great example in, in Glasgow um, about a month ago where uh, we know of a fact that... Um, uh, a major conference didn't come to Glasgow because there was insufficient high-end accommodation to accommodate the VIPs. There were not enough suites. Yet, there's loads of accommodation, but it is, a, is it of the right kind? So I think what we're trying to do in the phase leading on from our creation of the Tourism Development Framework is trying to match supply and demand, but supply of the right nature and demand of the right nature. And I think that point about Barcelona is, is exactly that. Thank you. Um, I've got Tom and Eva wanting to come in. Uh, Tom? Yeah. Um, there's clearly pockets like, like Edinburgh. Um, and, you know, we've had this great uh, um, growth in the North Highlands. However, Gairloch now has 100 less bed nights than it did 10 years ago in terms of availability. So, you know, whilst we are growing like this, 
you know, we're actually, if you look back and uh, at the statistics on on the depopulation, if you like, of, of available accommodation, um, we're actually way behind where we were before. So, um, so yes, there are pockets where you know th there will be concern, but there's other areas where there are real opportunities for businesses to to grow as well, and and for the visitor numbers to increase. We saw an increase of 29,000 new uh, new visitors last year, who put nine million pounds of additional visitor spend into to the Highlands. But there's, there is room for growth there in terms of the accommodation sector. Eva? Um, I was just going to agree with what Riddle said there. It's, it is about the, the, the type of accommodation that, that the, the planners give you know, um, permission to, to, to build. Because they had exactly the same or a similar situation in Dublin 20, 25 years ago, where they took in all the stag and hen parties they could get hold of because it was part of the Celtic tiger. Um, but, you know, six or seven years into that and complaints from other guests in hotels and other places um, led to them actually looking at it again and hotels saying, absolutely not, we're not doing it. And I would suggest that there is, um, it, there is a growth we're looking at here. You know, if you're right at the beginning of your growth, you take in anybody. But if you're a very mature destination, then I think you have to be quite picky. Richard, I think you had a quick supplementary. Yeah, can I just ask a supplementary on that? And this is a very familiar debate from Speyside, where, uh, albeit I'm slightly critical of the whisky companies who could do more, they do play a crucial role in tourism through the visitor centres and inviting overseas visitors who are sales teams or whoever they are, and they're often looking for places to put these people up, 50 or 60 or 40 at a time, and they have to use the hotels in there and in Aviemore, as opposed to in Speyside. I want to ask how that's joined up, you know, if there's a lack of top quality hotel uh, accommodation, whatever it may be, how's that joined up with the planners, with the tourism bodies uh, and entrepreneurs and companies who could build hotels and accommodation? Um, if, I, if I can respond initially on that, clearly the tourism development framework was a major step forward there because it, it identified challenges and issues. Um, all 32 local authorities plus the two national parks contributed to that. So I think there was buy-in in a way that we've never seen before. I was told before I kicked off that, that if you got a dozen or so local authorities to support it, you do really well. Um, I'm fairly competitive, and so therefore we got 32. Um, so there, there's a buy-in from a local authority point of view. I think the bit that's missing is the supply and demand piece, which is to convince a private sector investor to come in, you have to show that there is real demand that can be met um, and that it's worth their while investing. We work really closely with Scottish Development International, who are the, the inward investment um, part of uh, Scottish government, and um, they are clearly working with local authorities to try and make that bridge between investors uh, and opportunities. So it's up to the local authority to identify land and make it easy for, planners, uh, for the planners to approve and then the investors to come on board. But I think if we can identify real demand from real data um, and, and bring that evidence to the table, then that's going to make the biggest difference. So from where I sit, um, it's much more joined up than it was before, and I think we could do a wee bit more to enhance that. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to draw um, matters to a close because Parliament's about to sit in plenary session and the committee cannot sit at the same time as the plenary session of Parliament. But uh, you've certainly uh, covered a lot um, in terms of what your priorities are for the sector. If there are areas that you feel that haven't been covered that you would have liked to raise, you are, of course, at liberty to write to the committee. And I'd like to thank you all for coming here today and giving us your evidence. Thanks very much and we'll now go into private session. <laughs>